I, like what I'm thinking is I want to say something to that kid. I'm gonna be like, yo, hold on. Yo, just hold on for a minute. Uh-huh. Cause like this joint is not complicated. Like you you spend a week here, you'll have it. And it won't be and be like, okay, now I know what you're about. Now I know what you're talking about. You call it this, but we call it that. You'll make those connections. Uh-huh. But if you are impatient or if you are afraid, you'll walk away and put up your walls and be like, that's not my place. And like that fear of the unknown will hurt you in that way. And you you can go into that space and you can understand what it's about. It's not that complicated. There's a mm-hmm. lot of people in here who aren't that smart and they're still in here. So like you can do it too, like for anybody, like, <laughs> you know? And so like, uh, and so I think, I mean, obviously there's a lot of smart people too, but it doesn't mean there no, they're no, there's no greater proportion of smart people here than there is on the streets of East Oakland. That's for sure. Man. Greetings, everyone. My name is Alfredo Gonzalez Valenzuela, and you are now at the Climate Frontline. Greetings, good morning, afternoon, or night, wherever you may be. I just want to thank you for taking some time today to listen to another conversation that will change the climate narrative. This past weekend, I had a chance to have a conversation with Khaled Kadir. He is a professor at UC Berkeley as well as Presidio Graduate School. And what I appreciate most about him is that he meets you where you're at. And that's whether through language or your educational level. So welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me today. Super happy to be here. <laughs> we're, we're right now at UC Berkeley. What does that mean to you? I mean, it means we're, we're on top of stolen land, right? So that's what it means to me, first and foremost. That, that building, you can kind of see it through the window over there. Uh-huh. Underneath that building, there are thousands of bones of Native people. That are just stored under that building. Not buried, stored by UC. And they refuse to give it back. So it's like, wow. like that's where we're at. Like we're next to those ancestors right now. So yeah. uh, hopefully what we're doing is is trying to make good on some of their values. So yeah, it's important to acknowledge where we're at, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, and like, it's, it's like, like I, we could see the building, you know, it's not like an abstract idea. It's like that, that Hearst. Jim, it's like right there, underneath there. Like, look how long my arm is. And I'm like, imagine that there were thousands of these, like, under that. That's just, it's just weird on one hand. And it's also like, uh, you know, you put it under, you put it in the basement and it's invisible. But I think it's important to like, if it was visible, if it was like out in the open, it mm-hmm. would shock us every time we see it. And I think it should shock us in that way to like yeah. not forget. So we do something about it. And who were the peoples that lived here? Do you know? I don't know all the different tribal groups. There were a number of them. The Ohlone people were like were predominant, uh, but there are a number of other tribes that were that were among the groups that lived here. Um, uh, and I don't know specifically whose remains are there. I mm-hmm. don't think it is just the Ohlone folks. I think it's other tribal groups around you know what is now California that whose whose ancestors are there. So yeah. This whole campus was built um, in the Strawberry Creek watershed. And that's another thing that I think is lost today. The creek is right there, too. You can see all that that invasive vine comes mm-hmm. down to the creek right next to those redwood trees. And um, the entire campus was designed to be in the watershed of this creek. And then as sort of the contemporary era came about, we sort of forgot the creek and and tried to overrule it with our buildings and our pathways and stuff. And there are groups that are trying to bring the creek back so people understand, like, this was this was designed around a watershed. It wasn't designed out of some convenience it, around, like, you know, where it is in relation to downtown. It was like, oh, we're going to put this in the Strawberry Creek watershed so that we can use that creek in a beneficial way. So, yeah. so a little bit of the natural history of this place. Yeah. And I mean, you've been here for a couple of years. How did all this get started? 
the university. Is, yeah, like it's yeah. an academic yeah. institution yeah. that I think yeah. people would name there's, it as the best in the world publicly. Yeah. But yeah, there's a great there's a great clip um, of Dr. Martin Luther King speaking about the origin of universities like this. That's really beautiful. I can send it to you. Um, this is a land grant school. So the United States gave a piece of land for the founding of this institution. That's the idea. We're going to grant you this land and you develop a public institution on top of it. Now, the primary focus was on engineering and agriculture. Like mm -hmm. you need to do work that benefits our agriculture. That meant do work that benefits white farmers because this is happening at the exact same time that the United States is giving out land to white farmers all over the Western United States and denying access to land for black Americans. The whole denial of 40 acres and a mule is happening at the exact same time that land grants are be land being given away to white farmers and land grant schools are being created to support the economic interests of those white farmers. So, you know, the school comes from a dirty history. The school is founded on white supremacy, industrialization, and capitalism, you know, to put those three together, basically. And uh, that doesn't mean that's all it is, but it is like, and that doesn't mean it wasn't contested. It was deeply contested. And people fought over the identity of the school. And I mean, the school is this, this, we're directly tied to the atom bomb here at Berkeley. And you know, like that, like those bombs that landed on Japan, we had a hand in the creation of those, a big hand. Oppenheimer was here. And, uh, and so like, but that history has always been contested and fought over. And, you know, this is also where, you know, some of the early battles in Third World Liberation Front and ethnic studies sort of came. UC Berkeley was at the center of that, the anti-apartheid movement. Yeah. So this is always, and that's one of the reasons I feel uncomfortable, but okay being here is that it is a contested space. It is not claimed, you know? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And to what extent have student and student movements helped shape yeah. that narrative or history? I think they've had a big, big role. You know, when the free speech movement happened, everybody was against it. The chancellor was against it. The newspaper, the Daily Cow, student-run independent newspaper, they were against it. The faculty were against it. Like, overwhelmingly, everyone was against it. Today, they love to claim it. They have a cafe named after it on campus. Mm -hmm. Like, the narrative has inverted. And, and to me, that's a good lesson. You know, I think about, like, Occupy about Black Lives Matter and how when these things came out the door, they weren't very popular, you know, like they were these radical anarchist, fringist, Marxist, whatever label people want to throw on them. They, they, you know, they throw dirt on them. The press throws dirt on them, all of that. Now we all talk about the 1%, you know, even the president talks about the 1%. And like that language only became in our casual language because of those movements. And, and something that is born in opposition doesn't always stay there. And maybe one day people are going to want to claim it because they're going to see the rightness of it. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that's the case for every one of these movements that we see, but that's like something to remember if you're involved in struggle that like, you know, that you start from a place where people are throwing dirt on you because of a righteous cause doesn't take away from the righteousness of it. And history has taught us that people will try to own it later. Look at what's happened with John Lewis. You know, he's, he dies in state and everybody wants to claim civil rights now. They all want to be proud of that. But when he was doing that, it wasn't popular. He was doing a time where they put dogs and fire hoses on people for doing it. So I think it, it's a reminder to me that when it's hard, that's okay that it's hard. You know, people are gonna, that this is, it is, it's, we don't call it a struggle for no reason, you know, so. So uh, I was gonna ask one one thing that uh, I see you do, and I think it's um, something I've been meaning to ask is that you often refer to um, when you're asked a question or you you know something is put forward to you, and maybe this is just your educator, but the question is like, to what extent do you feel like um, giving forward books? is is uh is is helpful in the sense of changing the narrative around how we understand the work depends on the person yeah but okay. um <laughs> but uh 
You know I what think, I mean, though, right? I do know what you mean. I do. I mean, I did this morning when I was like, hey, check out this book, Racial Ecologies. I'm all excited about it. Or this book, Limits, about mm-hmm. limits the, about the limits of, of, of growth. Um, I think um, I'm still trying to figure it all out. Okay. I ain't got to figure it out. And I'm listening to people around me. And trying to understand what they're doing and and fit it in with the other things I've learned. And so I find it really useful when there's somebody bringing a high-level conversation that I'm learning from. And that's like bringing new ideas and new ways of thinking. I find a lot of joy in that. So, uh, so I like sharing that. And like also to make it clear that like it's funny like. I don't really think I have many original ideas and that's fine. I don't need to have original ideas. Like, (laughs) like, you know, uh, it's, I'm pulling ideas that I've learned from other people and putting them together. Some of them I put together in my own ways, but I'm sure 30 other people did too. So, and I'm sure I'm understanding like 10% of what they actually meant. So, you know, so I reread stuff sometimes to try to understand a little better. Um, uh, and, Given the like world that at least I live in right now, like, and I think most of us, like, um, it's hard to get access to that knowledge and that way of thinking. Otherwise, like, the the like clear alternative way to do that that I can think of is to sit with people who who have that wisdom and learn from them. But that takes time, mm-hmm. you know, and and access. And we all don't have that kind of access to people, right? I mean, we're at UC Berkeley, you know, they have a police department that keeps people who appear to be houseless off of this campus and deny them access, you know, so the rest of us can enjoy like an unmitigated sort of scene, you know, and that's a problem. And, but it also, it's, it's like a, a clear example of how we police access to places, you know, and then tuition and then, you know, legal papers to be in the country and all that baloney that limits access to these kind of institutions and the kind of teachers and stuff like that. Um, uh, and so I find books as a way to learn from those folks, but books is a very, from my perspective, it's a very like to, to, to try to read a book. To understand what the author is getting at, that's a very Western idea. Um, and Timothy Mitchell, who you know I love, uh, he's got a book, Colonizing Egypt. And in that book, he has a chapter about what the British colonizers found when they went to Egypt and they saw books. But in a book at that time in Egypt, it's not the Arabs had tons of knowledge and, and we, we stole so much of that and, and recycled it into and, and imagined that the Western civilization was the first that found it. People are more aware of that now. But in the books, it wasn't like a, a full page top to bottom of the author writing something. It was like maybe a quarter or a third of the page at the center were the author's words. And then there were all this like scribble around it and there was more scribble around it because you never just read a book. You sat with the person who wrote it and learned the book from them. The book didn't contain all of the knowledge. The person contained the knowledge. And knowledge was passed down from person to person. As opposed to write a book, anyone can read it and now speak about it like they know it. It was like, no, you had to sit with somebody to take the knowledge from them. There was a chain. Silsila is the word in Arabic. And, And you couldn't teach that book until that teacher gave you authorization. Okay, now you've learned it. You can go teach it. And so that was how knowledge was transmitted. It wasn't just words on a page spread all over the world and then you try to figure out what does the author mean by this. Yeah. No, you sat with the author and learned what they meant, you know? Yeah. So it's a very different conception of knowledge and how you learn and and the social characteristics of how learning happens. So Yeah. I guess what I'm hearing from you is that it's more of a tool that was used to pass down knowledge with them from elders through yeah. communities. Yeah. And many of those books just had aphorisms. But you'd have to sit and spend a day learning the depth of the meaning of that aphorism. And then you could recite by memory the, the single sentence aphorism. But there was a whole shark, a whole explanation that went with it. Like, what's the what's the meaning and the wisdom and the power behind this that's not written in the book that you got? So, yeah. 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 And I think there's the other side where you just use books to leverage political will and, and agendas, right? And, yeah. yeah. And I think those are two contrasting uses of the book to and i think in 
some ways people can just label both as education, yeah. quote unquote, you yeah. know, and I like think junk it, books. Yeah. Right. And I think what you're saying, though, was um, it just depends who the person is and, yeah. and who who it is that you're talking to, because ultimately, you know, it depends on, on if they if they can even read a book, yeah. right? Like, yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. If they have the luxury to read a book, if they can read a book, and then what language are they reading it in? Let's be real, mm-hmm. you know, like that's a huge barrier to access, and like the language is not independent from the content. Mm-hmm. Those two are related. There are ways that in English we understand words and language that are different than the way other languages relate to words and language. And so the meanings are different. And so I think that that becomes very reductive if all we do is read in a single language and learn in a single language. Well, we're only going to learn one way of thinking or a narrow set of ways of thinking, you know. So I think that's a big problem. So, yeah. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of the book we were just talking about because, like, you know, Quechua is not a written language. So that's beautiful. And and a book that's that's half half was it half Spanish half Quechua yeah half Spanish half it's Quechua. like it's like this is not a book for everybody no right and I think that's beautiful you know it, yeah. because it holds something special that I can't get access to and it's my loss you know when I think about that so I think that's yeah. beautiful to those are those are treasures you know mm-hmm. yeah you know we're on Berkeley campus because you might be able to hear the kids outside playing now so uh huh yeah yeah thanks for you know, just sharing what you know about uh, Berkeley, because I, I, I mean, I had some ideas, you know, I, th- I think I tried to stay in the mindset of being curious rather than like, yeah, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, this has happened, you know? Yeah, uh, that's a healthy approach. I think being curious is a healthy approach. Uh-huh. So, you know, especially when we don't know about a thing, you know, these days we're real quick to label. And yeah. That's dangerous. I think, you know, mm-hmm. it's not fair. It's not healthy. So it's it's overly simplistic. So yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh in, in many ways, you know, it it, it kind of gets into the topic of education, right? Cuz mm-hmm. books can be part of education just like they can be uh other things. I think the quote that comes to me is the one that my dad said is uh an open book is an open mind, right? And mm-hmm. and uh I'm, I'm for one, thankful for the education. Uh, more particularly, I think I'm more thankful for the people that I've met like you over the mm-hmm, years who mm-hmm. have given me that relationship to position myself in, in, in better situations. And it's part of education. But um, yeah, I'm just curious to know what what is what does education mean to you and where does academia fall into all that yeah cuz yeah. for someone that's not familiar with these terms yeah. especially like yeah. as esl student mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. may just see, say academia is education yeah. and education is academia yeah same no it's more i think it's more complicated than that i mean it's an industry right like there's a whole industry around this and let's not be mistaken that like you know you come to a place like uc berkeley it's it's a bit of a factory you know, and a lot of people crank through this factory and you get a you get a number when you come here and that is who you are, your student ID number. Mm-hmm. Like like that's how a factory works, right? And they run you through the system based on that unique number that only you have. And it's it's important to remember that there is a degree of like depersonalization that goes on there. And that's not how traditional education was. It's very personal, you know. Um so it can get very reductive. What you can learn here can be general knowledge that maybe applies anywhere, but it loses all usefulness in specificity, right? So like general knowledge that you need sunlight and water to grow a plant, but you know, any idiot knows that. You gotta grow a plant in California versus growing one in Mississippi. It's a different story because there's different conditions and that's what actually matters, you know? Um, I think, uh, uh, Related to what you said, something I often tell people who come here is, um, you know, the first thing we often look at is like what courses I want to take. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the wrong approach. Yeah. Because you be like a question of like who's teaching the course. That's what matters. Uh-huh. A great teacher will make a boring subject really awesome. Mm-hmm. And a cruddy teacher will make the coolest class horrible. Mm-hmm. So you may walk out of a class 
you thought you hated biology is because you had a bad biology teacher who didn't speak to you or who didn't see you, right? Mm -hmm. Or you, and suddenly you find yourself like, how did I suddenly get so interested in math? I never knew I liked math. It's because you never had a math teacher that spoke to you in that way. And so I think the real thing is you got to choose your teachers, not your classes. And this is a very different way of thinking about knowledge and where you're getting it from. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's something that most people don't know coming into these institutions. They're too busy focused on the, the topic or the classes. No, target the people. The people will is who you're going to learn from. And, and you will continue to learn from when the class comes and goes, right? And um, and it puts it, it reminds you that, that education is, a, is about relationships. It's not about information. If it was just about information, we'd be done with teachers and you just Google it. That'd be the end of it, right? But that's clearly not how we learn. That's yeah. how we... That's how we become misinformed, right? That's how we, we don't gain any wisdom about what we're doing. So, yeah. yeah. So I think that like, you know, choosing carefully the people you want to learn from. And there's something that, that is related to a conversation you and I were having earlier about um, before you come into these spaces, you got to know what you're about. I firmly believe that. I think personally, I think it's dangerous to come to an institution of higher education, particularly in the United States, if you don't know who you are. If you don't know what you're about. And I think obviously there's And when you say that you're talking about the work you do or because what you know about could mean just the work that I do. Yeah. Or is it also like the personal side? I think it's actually all the personal side. It's like, what are your priorities? What are your values? What are your like, you know, what is your identity? Mm -hmm. Like, like. Do you, are you standing on somewhat firm ground around who you are, what you're about, what your priorities are, what you do when you see an old lady waiting to cross the street? Mm-hmm. If you don't know what you do in that moment, you ain't ready to come here yet. Make sure you know what you do in that moment so you always do the right thing before you walk into this place. Because this place, nobody encourages you, to, encourages, you to, encourages you to help an old lady cross the street at Berkeley. Mm-hmm. They like, no, you got to go study. You got to go do this. You got to go seek out that opportunity. You have to remember like, wh- what kind of person do I want to be in the world? Like, who am I in that value sense? Then come to this place and gain the knowledge that there is to be gained here. Because there's a real danger of gaining the culture that this place pushes on people. And it's, I don't think it's a healthy culture at all. We have a mental health crisis on this campus. Like, we have a police department that walks around with guns on this campus. Like, that's not a healthy space if you got to have armed guards walking around. That's a sign of sickness. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, and I think that, like, if you're going to enter into a sick place, you better be healthy. And that doesn't mean there's not benefit to be gained from that place, but you better be healthy before you get there. Yeah. So. One, one thing that I found was this map. It was a visual that showed academic papers that cite other academic papers. Mm. And it was a map where a white line was drawn from a citation to a citation okay. in a world map, right? Mm-hmm. And you can see the layout of, you know, the, the North America, South America, Europe yeah. and whatnot. And most, if not all the lines were from Europe to America and some mm-hmm. to Asia and whatnot. But like, mm-hmm. you know, it tells below- you who's speaking to whom. Yeah, below the the equator line, you know, it was like a few lines, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and when I try to you know move forward and and try to see the extent to which this is all gonna impact Cusco with eucalyptus and air quality emissions, it was just like, who's thinking about that? Where where are the systems for collective action? It, I mean, the studies are happening in other cities in the U.S. and Europe. But it was just like a blank to me. So, so was that all part of the experience of what academia is? Is that something fair to say, or or do you see academia as something else? I think that's part of it. But I think um, first, I would love to see that same map, except <laughs> I only want lines on that map to be when they're writing about something related to the global south. Because I want to see how much of writing about Cusco is happening between Europe and the U.S. and doesn't even involve Cusco, Mm. right? Like, how much are they trying to talk about other people? It's like, don't talk about my family. Talk about your own family. Like, get out of my house, you know? If you're going to talk about my family, come talk to me, you Mm -hmm. know? So there's that that whole colonial idea. We're just going to talk about somebody else and and do what we want with them, that idea. Um, That whole othering. Um, 
I think academia has that in its history. I mean, academia is a deeply sort of colonial project historically. We're in the department we're in, international and area studies. The origin of area studies was to colonize the world. This is like, you know, around the time of Vietnam, they're like, let's go study Southeast Asia. You know mm-hmm. why? Mm-hmm. Because we got to know who we're bombing and who we're controlling and all that baloney. Like, like this is an ugly history, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, but again, it's contested and that none of these people in this space are about that. They're all about something else, you know? Yeah. So the place isn't just what it was started as. And, and, you know, you know, beautiful things can grow in the darkness and, um, And so I think the other side of it is in this same building that we're in, in another part of the building, is the American Culture Center. Every student at UC Berkeley has to take an American Cultures class to graduate. An American Cultures class is a class that's about race. And it has, you can't graduate. Is that from what Berkeley. it's called? American? American Culture. Hmm. So they originally wanted to call it the Ethnic Studies Requirement, hmm. but they didn't win that battle. And, you know, uh, There's a there's an interesting video on the American Cultures website where he he talks about this language and naming and he actually thinks it worked out better because now it doesn't turn it into oh that's just the ethnic studies thing uh-huh. over in the corner it's like no you're American this is about you uh-huh. this is about your culture and about black people and about Latino people and about Asian people and about indigenous people and like it has to deal with at least three distinct racial categories in a comparative manner in that class. So there's all sorts of AC classes on mm-hmm. campus and you can't graduate without taking one. So you have to deal. And I think that's actually really wonderful. And that's here. And that's born out of third world liberation front, the anti-apartheid movement. That's where that came from. Mm-hmm. And they got the, the faculty on this campus, the tenured faculty voted overwhelmingly to require this, 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 this class. Yeah. That, that space, which, myself included, would point to as often very regressive votes to support that requirement says that there's it's more complicated than just all or nothing. You know, there's a lot of talk about decolonizing the university, and I think there's truth to that, but I think we have to be careful to not throw out the wisdom that's also there. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes we go one side or the other all the way. I do think we have to decolonize the way we learn and what we learn. Mm-hmm. I do think we need to understand the sort of implicit western dominant frameworks that inform so much of what we believe and think yeah but i don't think that 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 means there's no value there either you know yeah. so yeah i want to come back to what you were saying about family and who gets to speak about what family because yeah p- part of my motive to starting this podcast was really changing the narrative around how we understand these things yeah and as someone who has now you know done environmental science work worked in all these different privileged wealthy spaces um i also have my family who's still in peru and speaks a different language and and whatnot and to land the plane here when i read what i realized is when i was reading news whether it's here or or elsewhere when they were talking about climate change they were talking about CO2 emissions, mm-hmm. right? Carbon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that to me is already a type of science, right? Yeah. And for me to go to some isolated place in Peru or Brazil, conversations that I had this past week, right? Start talking about carbon and oxygen? Yeah. <laughs> If I start using the word addiction, carbon mm-hmm. or nitrogen, any of that stuff, it's like already a separation, right? You're already setting up the table in the... You're, you're using a table already, yeah. right? And you're right. claiming authority. Yeah. Like, I know something you don't know. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And So what and, do you do? So in, in that sense, you know, that's why um, I, I wanted to take this opportunity with this podcast to shift the narrative. Because when I approach those conversations, I approach it, the, the recent conversation was more about, okay, water is not going to exist in my hometown. Mm. We can mm-hmm. talk about you thinking that, you know, media has created a, a hoax b- behind climate and we can disagree with that. And, yeah. and I still have respect for you. Yeah. If you come visit my hometown and I take you on a hike and show you places where water is no longer going to be, mm-hmm. that's a fact. Kelly, what are you going to say? Like, 
you gonna you're gonna drink it out of the air? Yeah. Come on. Right, right, right. And so And how are we gonna deal with that issue? Like talk all you want about CO two, how are we gonna get water? That's what I'm interested in. Right, right. I see that. And I just think that that's a place where lang- language needs to play a role, you know, because mm-hmm. if if what we're funding in in the Western world is specifically on carbon emissions mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the impact report of this and the impact report of that mm-hmm. is about carbon mm-hmm. emissions. Again, we're, we're already talking about a table. Yeah. We're already talking about yeah. us using yeah. forks to eat yeah. Yeah. and the food already yeah. being cooked yeah. or ordered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's not a collective approach to me that says, let's cook together. Let's figure out how it is that we like to cook. Yeah. And again, analogies, right? And so I just Mm -hmm. want, I wanted to put this kind of shift in in, in, in changing in in the paradigm and how we talk about this issue in front of you to see, you know, what do you, what do you think about that? And, and, you know, I have mixed feelings. Um, I, I think at the at the heart of it, I completely agree. The only thing that that I stumble on is um, is you know we we know each other through our our time together at Presidio Graduate School, and Presidio is all about systems thinking mm-hmm. and understanding this at a system level. Why isn't there water? That comes back to carbon emissions, but not really. It actually comes back to industrialization. It comes back to like fossil fuel use in order to live a certain kind of lifestyle. It comes back to Europe and North America primarily like moving forward with a version of life that is actually death, you know, for many. Mm -hmm. And, And so by talking about carbon is a distraction from what what is underlying that carbon, but also by just talking about water may hide the fact that that water is related to the pickup truck that I drove to get here. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that's a, you know, it's an old pickup truck. It it probably pollutes more than, more than my bike does. That's for sure. You know? Yeah. And like, and so like linking those things I think is important. Um, But it's also context. Like, I don't think it's, particularly important to be talking about I don't know let me let me put this out there and I'm not sure about it <laughs> but I don't think it's particularly important to be talking about a farmer outside of Cusco about CO2 emissions because mm-hmm. he ain't about CO2 emissions he ain't creating them yeah. he's he's not he's dealing with the lack of water right or she's dealing with the lack of water um, or something else exactly yeah. exactly and I think what may be useful is first to talk about how we can help get her water or whatever she needs. And second, to to help understand the sort of global geopolitical things that have left her in the situation she's in, mm-hmm. right? Like, why is it that, that she's in a position like she's in and someone else is in a position like they're in, right? Yeah. Why is it that the that the corn farmer in, in Iowa is getting this subsidy while or, – or in France, the, the, the sheep farmer in France is getting this big subsidy and then they're dumping their crops on, on countries in the global south, like – and leaving her unable to sell food because it's not worth anything because there's free donations, quote – coming from the global north so i think those are important because that opens up space for her to, to also join the fight to for a right, righteous livelihood for herself and her people so yeah yeah carbon distracts from that carbon is a distraction yeah. i think another way i've been thinking about this is the extent to which any given person is connected feels rooted to the environment right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and to to the, use the example you're you're alluding to a farmer who's outside of Cusco may be experiencing the effects of climate change in a, in a way that we both may not even know about. We, we're so we're lost distant. on the environment that we couldn't understand what they, what they sense long before we do. Yeah. Yeah. A soft example, because they are families, could be education for their kids. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. taking that as an example, it could just mean education for kids that's different than carbon already. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think going back to your systems... And, and, and analogy, educating their kids about carbon uh-huh. is a way of pulling their kids away from them. And that's not useful either. Yeah. 
and and it goes back i think to the systems is if if carbon and the sciences is a way in which we're making sense of our disconnect from land here mm. and it's getting institutions to change and mm-hmm. led yada 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 all those slang terms that come with it mm-hmm. fine you know yeah. if that but, works for us yeah okay. but for them it may be not in spanish not written and a conversation a relationship that happens right or it may be just be us out of the picture period we don't know you know i'd go a step further (laughs) i'd go a step further i think we talk about carbon here Uh uh-huh because we don't know how to talk about it yeah because we are so dumb we are so buffered from the reality of the environmental world Mm -hmm. that we don't understand it. And so we have to translate it through the language of chemistry to make any sense of it, Mm -hmm. right? Because we're so disconnected from where our food comes from, you know? Mm -hmm. Like we're so disconnected from the things that sustain us, right? The things we breathe, the things we eat, and the things we drink. We are so far from them. We, We pay someone else to have shelter for us. We pay someone else... To have food. We don't even pay someone for food. We pay someone who pays someone who pays someone who grows the food. Yeah. We, we're so far away from it. And I think that that's a, that is like, that's how impoverished we are. We're impoverished in understanding, to borrow the sort of the, the framework of one of my colleagues, Clara Tullwalker. We're impoverished in our own understanding. And we're so disconnected from the effect we have on the world. And we can only understand it when we translate it through the language of science. And even then, we don't really understand it, which is why we're not doing anything about it. Mm-hmm. You know? Because we it hasn't hit us in the way it should. You know? So yeah. I think that that's a, we have a major sort of, sort of spiritual loss there, I think. So clearly, language is crucial. Crucial to the not only how you personally navigate the world but also how others do right Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. i'm curious it's a question that keeps coming up in my head when i do these interviews for the podcast is you know if if there was a youth you know who has been struggling just getting by has mostly spent their time out in the street you know Mm -hmm. um if they were to you know, meet you, for example, and they were to walk in and be in a fly in, 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 in a meeting God room help with them. you, right? <laughs> what would be the, the, the term or the, the slang term, the acronym that they would just be like, what the heck is that? You mean about me? No, no, no. Like, you know, in, in the in the spaces you're at, maybe it's an, an, an I acronym. See. Like, I see. If they were like a, a shadow behind me and seeing the world I'm moving through, what would they say about that world? Yeah, just like, mm, I, I do think that when, when you come into spaces, you start using so many acronyms and, and language mm-hmm. that it, if you don't know what it is, then it's like, oh, then do you really belong here? You know, yeah, like, yeah. for example, business school, right? Like, yeah. what is a ledger? What is a brick yeah. and mortar? Like, if I don't yeah. know those things... You're, like, outside. Yeah, so... You know, that's good. I like... I, I get where you're going here. Um, at least I think I do. <laughs> um, uh, I, like, what I'm thinking is I want to say something to that kid. I'm going to be like, yo, hold on. Yo, just hold on for a minute. Uh-huh. Because, like... This joint is not complicated. Like, you you spend a week here, you'll have it. And it won't be, and be like, okay, now I know what you're about. Now I know what you're talking about. You call it this, but we call it that. You'll make those connections. Uh-huh. But if you are impatient or if you are afraid, you'll walk away and put up your walls and be like, that's not my place. And, like, that fear of the unknown will hurt you in that way. And you, you can go into that space and you can understand what it's about. It's not that complicated. There's a lot of people in here who aren't that smart and they're still in here. So like you can do it too, like for anybody, like, <laughs> you know? And so like, uh, and so I think, I mean, obviously there's a lot of smart people too, but it doesn't mean there no, there no, there's no greater proportion of smart people here than there is on the streets of East Oakland. That's for sure not. Right. And like, there's just people who have access to education here. That's the difference. And Mm -hmm. you give those folks in the streets of East Oakland access to education, you'll find out, hey, what do you know? You know, they can do anything just as good or better than anyone else. Right. So I think that like, really like to, there's a fine line here. 
don't be intimidated by words you don't understand. Mm-hmm. You know, be like, oh, there's something to learn there. Like, that's a beautiful opportunity. At the same time, don't be arrogant about it either. Because that can happen too. Like, like, oh, they're just stupid. I don't want to hear it. Like, there's that to me is a, is, a, is a self-destructive defense mechanism too, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we're so close to so many refineries around here that... Woo-hoo! Six um, of them. Six of them up and down the bay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Real effects on kids' lives. Yeah. But you went to school here too, right? Graduate school, yeah. yeah. Graduate school. Yeah. yeah. I've and been on this campus for 20 years. Yeah. So I, I'm curious to know, you know, how has... Uh, aside going from a student to mm-hmm. uh, a professor, how has... I'll staff your... for a minute too. <laughs> and you were staff also. Just okay. for one semester. Okay. Mm-hmm. How, how has your role changed in that in that process and not specific to titles but like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. how have you experienced the work i've grown up here in many ways um i mean i came here as an adult but i kind of grew up here and what i mean by that is um i started out as an engineering graduate student environmental engineering fair but like still engineering still living in that box mm-hmm. um how how are you going to study environmental engineering, which is like, you know, air quality and water quality are like ground zero in that space, right? Um, as is hazardous waste. Like these are things that environmental engineers think about all the time. How are you going to study environmental engineering at Berkeley and not connect it to the six refineries? You know what I mean? I mean, like, like, and, and many people do it in fairness. They do that all the time. They're cranking them through and not thinking about it. That's changing. I'm really excited about some of the changes that are happening in environmental engineering here to to be real about this stuff. Um, Historically, though, they had walls up. You know, they they sent more environmental engineers to go work for Chevron than they did to go work for some environmental justice org historically at this institution. I mean, that's the wrong that's the wrong team. As far as I'm concerned, you're on the wrong team then. Right. And like uh, Chevron has that famous refinery in Richmond that exploded a couple of years back. Um, Mm -hmm. Um. so from my perspective, like that's just not who I am. And so when I came here and I'm studying environmental engineering, but I'm here. And by being here, I'm like seeing this stuff and it forced me to, to like face some contradictions. Like, what am I doing? Like, what do I think I'm doing? You know, and what I think I'm doing is not what I'm actually doing. And I, I am blessed to have the privilege that like I didn't have to go become an engineer and get a job as an engineer to support my family. Like I wasn't thinking in those terms, um, which la- allowed me the space to say, mm, maybe I don't want to do that kind of work. Maybe I don't want to even think about going to work for Chevron. And, and maybe I want to think about work that's more meaningful that may not be as lucrative. And maybe I want to spend some time in school learning about things that may not bring me a check. You know, but I'm learning about them because I want to understand things. And that's a great privilege to be in that space. But I was in it and and I had the right influences around me to push me to do that learning. So Mm -hmm. I think that was really helpful. I wouldn't I didn't I didn't go seek this stuff out on my own. People came Tell me more about these influencers. What do you mean by that? Like, you know, there were there were three women in in graduate school. Um, I, I won't share their names, but if they ever listen to this, they will know who they are. <laughs> um, uh, they were a real blessing in my life. Um, they were all city planning graduate students here. And they, they like treated me with respect. And, you know, cause I came in like idiot. I was an engineer in a class with them, didn't know the stuff I was talking about. They could have just written me off, you know, like here's that idiot engineer, I obviously didn't come in trying to steamroll what I thought. I they, I guess they could see that I was trying to learn, but they treated me with respect, even if I was like intellectually a child from their perspective, right? And they encouraged me. They, they put good books in front of me. They pushed me to read them even when I struggled. And I said like one book that they really, there's one person who really got me to read Rule of Experts. I hope she listens to this podcast. Um, <laughs> uh, she speaks Spanish too, so she can listen to all your podcast episodes. Okay. Um uh, she pushed me to read Rule of Experts by Timothy Mitchell and she really made me do it and that really and 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 she and the other two they like stuck with me as I struggled with these ideas I don't think they realized how big of an effect they had on me um, 
And it was mostly because they were like, they were willing to like help me work through some of the things I didn't know, you know? Um, and, and like that was, that really opened me up to other ways of understanding what I was doing and that, that door opened and from there it just flowed, you know? Yeah. So I think that was really important that I was in a class in a graduate class with these three women were all in that class too. And we became friends and they, they helped scaffold my learning to move beyond engineering. And that was really helpful. So it was about, it was about mentors and no this isn't mentors of the faculty type. Faculty barely gave me the time of day, you know? There were some that gave me a little bit, but most, not a lot, you know? They at least let me in the classes, and I'm grateful for that. But, like, these were three colleagues, ostensibly peers, right? They were, we were similar age. We were moving through our PhDs together, all of us. And they they helped guide me through that process. They were in a different discipline than me, and I think that was important, that they brought a different angle. Um but uh, and they were honoring that I was trying to get beyond my own disciplinary knowledge to understand things more broadly. So mm-hmm. I think that was really important for me. So, yeah, Let, let's take a second to break down what you mean by expert, because mm-hmm. I've shared this with you before. But a lot of the lessons that I've learned have been from people that don't have PhDs. Yeah, absolutely. That have not been in academia and perhaps have never really stepped out of. Uh, Peru or other countries that I visited. So, to to what extent is a person an expert, and can do do they have to be e- educated formally? Like, of course not. No, of course not. You know, the different. It it's funny how this this word expert like um, has taken on a certain kind of meaning, especially in the media. We're going to go out to the expert on XYZ and interview them and that sort of thing. And that's a big problem because it's devaluing other forms of knowledge, other forms of experiential knowledge. It's devaluing other forms of knowing. Like you become an expert because you got a piece of paper. You don't necessarily know anything about anything, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, I think that's a big problem. I think on the other side, there's this sense among some today that anybody is just as valid speaking about anything as anyone else. That ain't true. No, like, like I say this often with all due respect, I don't want you treating my drinking water. You're not an environmental engineer. I am. I know a lot about treating drinking water and I love you, but I don't want you treating my drinking water because I know about things about it that you probably don't know because I spend some time learning about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's to say that like, not everybody has all the same knowledge. It's not that everybody's even all the time. But at the same time, the way we establish expertise is a way of sort of, uh, how would I, how would I, what is the language here? It's, it's about power fundamentally. And it's mm-hmm. about, it's about establishing, controlling and maintaining power among certain ways of thinking and doing, right? And by claiming expertise, it's a claim to power, right? Tanya Lee Murray writes in The Will to Improve that um, it that it's about uh, what's the language she uses? She says to 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 go to go into like someone else's life and do anything. Like if I'm gonna go go to to Cusco and work on water there, if I'm gonna take on a position of trusteeship, like I'm the expert, I'm the water expert, I'm gonna tell you how to do it. That's me asserting my power over those people, that I'm the one who knows it and you don't. Like mm-hmm. and I think there's a real problem there. So I think that like, yes, you might have some specialized knowledge. No, that doesn't make you special. You know, like, let's put those two together. Like, like that, that your knowledge is, is necessarily always incomplete because no one has complete knowledge. Everyone's knowledges are incomplete and it's only in coming together and in a, in a space where we're even that we can come together and figure things out. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, we've talked a lot already. It's been a big journey. Yeah. It's been good. Um, would you mind just sharing a bit of how you would describe yourself and and who you are as a person. Um, Like I had mentioned, youth are going to be listening to this and I would just love for them to hear a little bit of who you are and and what is it that you enjoy doing in this journey called life. That's a big question. Um, There's a, there's a poem that, uh, that I want to use there, but I can't remember. Did you write it? No. Uh, 
An old white man wrote it, actually. Um, I can't remember the name of it offhand, and I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think about what that is. Um, it's, it's, he, he, I am a parcel of vain strivings tied, um, by Thoreau, by Henry David Thoreau. Uh, I am a parcel of vain strivings tied by a chance bond together. Dangling this way and that, their links were made so loose and wide, methinks, for milder weather. And the poem goes on. Uh, I looked it up, so I won't read it all because it's not short. But I, that, that poem has struck with me since I was a teenager. That idea that, like, I'm a parcel, a gathering of, of vain strivings. Strivings that are in vain sometimes. Um, and uh, it is, to me... It is a reminder of like how how small we are in some ways, and that's not to to that's not to sort of that's not to be self deprecating. That's just to, that's, there are billions of people in this world, and mm-hmm. we work really hard, but we we don't we don't control the outcomes of our work. You know, we control what we do to some extent, but we don't control the outcomes of it because there's so many other things at play. You know. Um, I might try to put something anti-racist in my syllabus, but that doesn't mean the class is going to go right or it's going to land right on a person. Like I can't control all of that. I can do my best. And so um, when I think about myself, I, I, I try to remember that a lot. Like that's a, that's a deep belief I have. Um, I, uh, I'm someone who has been really blessed and always encouraged by my father to, to do whatever I want just to do it well. He was, he's kind of a hard ass. Like dad is still. And like, uh, I, I often say like he, my dad would be equally happy if I was a rocket scientist or a janitor or a carpenter or a president of the United States what he cares about is, am I like doing honest work? Am I like being real? Am I working hard? Am I like, uh, and am I doing in balance? Uh, he might call me on that lack of balance. I, I'm not quite so balanced with my work life right now, but, um, but like, that's been a, I, that's been a blessing for me because it's allowed me to like stumble and explore. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, I haven't had this pressure, to I haven't had this pressure to support my parents because they didn't need me to support them. And that's like, that's a weight that most people I encounter don't have, you know, and they're elderly now. And I think about that more now and what, mm-hmm. what that's going to look like. But like, um, when you don't have that pressure, you can make different choices. And I, and I, and I'm grateful for those being able to have done that. And I think that's a lot of the reasons why I've pursued the educational trajectory I've pursued and things like that, because I didn't have those other pressures. It was open to me, you know? Um, and I think up until this point in life, I've, I'm a teacher. That's what I am. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I never like sought that goal. Um, it's gone well. I am in a stage right now where I'm not sure how much longer it's going to go for. So, sure. Yeah. You know, um, but it's been, it's been good. I feel like I've learned so much in the process. I hope I've benefited folks through that teaching. Um, okay. Well, this, this guy Kyle sounds pretty cool. Like hit me if up. I'm around the, you know, if they're around the Bay area, what, yep. what or what is the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, for someone that you know just listen to this you know if we weren't in a pandemic i'd be like i'd give you a couple cafes roll by i'll probably be at one of them drinking coffee and and reading a book or working on something you know Mm -hmm. that would be in the world of a pandemic you probably gotta like hit me up by email it's probably Mm -hmm. the best way to get a hold of me so um uh you know but if you're in the bay area Let's skip the Zoom call and let's just sit six feet apart and have a conversation. Like, <laughs> please. Like, I don't need any more screen time. Neither do you probably. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other things you want to share? Thoughts or? I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of this. I'm, I'm excited about this, this project that you're doing. And I'm really hopeful that it brings sort of a, a different, a different angle to a conversation that's kind of overrun its course in in other directions so i'm like excited about where this goes 
<laughs> Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Khaled as much as I did. That is actually a pretty trimmed down version of our conversation. If you're interested in listening into the whole conversation where we also touch on the Silicon Valley as well as other pieces of language, I would encourage you to become a Patreon and listen to the raw version of it. You can find out more about this podcast at climatefrontline.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. The communities who are experiencing the worst effects of climate change are those who are best positioned to innovate solutions. Thank you for tuning in and being part of the changing the narrative. See you next time at the Climate Frontline. Yeah.